I have been anxious to preach this message for a while now. Um, as I shared with you several weeks ago, I had kind of wanted to engage the uh, relationship passages uh, in the latter part of Ephesians, uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6, as it dealt with marriage and parenting and, uh, and the, the workplace relationship. I really wanted to deal with that in one sermon just to keep it brief because I was anxious to get to the passages that we are going to look at this morning. Uh, the Lord had other plans for that, but I have been very much looking forward to this final section of Ephesians. We have been in this sermon series on the letter to the Ephesians for the last several months, and I hope that you have been blessed and encouraged by it, as I have been, uh, as, as we have read and studied and, and examined the, the promises and the assurances of this letter. It has just filled me with uh, joy. It has filled me with a sense of anticipation. It has reminded me of the strength and the power that God has for us. It has spoken to me of the estimation of God valuing us, what, how God values us. And there is a lot to cover in these last eight verses that we're going to be focusing on this morning. And so without any more prelude, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into it. So let's pick up this morning in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. And this is the passage of Scripture where we read about the armor of God. Let's begin with verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now, I'm not going to do this with every verse in this passage this morning, but I believe that verse 10 really deserves to be dissected a little bit. It really needs to be pulled apart and look at some of the specific words. He begins the verse by saying, finally, finally. You know, and after spending six chapters proclaiming to and impressing upon us, his readers, the Ephesian church, his original readers, who we are in Christ, impressing upon us what Christ has done for us, proclaiming to us the treasures and the heavenly blessings that are ours in Christ, how we have been brought from death to life in Jesus Christ. We have heard about how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God for us. We have been instructed on what it looks like to live the transformed kind of life that we have been called out of and called into. We have looked at what it's supposed to look like as we we live lives of morality and purity and, and lifestyle, a lifestyle of godliness. We've seen what godly marriages should be like, what a godly parenting and child relationship should look like, what workplace behavior and relationship should like, look like. And so now, it seems to me that inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul is bringing this all together and he is putting the finishing touches on this amazing letter. A letter addressed to people that he loved dearly. He spent nearly three years doing life and relationship with these people. These were people that he cared about. People he was burdened for their walk with Christ. And so as he wraps up this letter, Paul sets forth both a beautiful summary and an awesome challenge for the believers reading this letter. He says, finally, be strong. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Now clearly this is the tone of a command, right? Be strong. This is a command being given. This is instruction that we are expected 
to obey and to follow. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that strength, at least physical strength, or excuse me, spiritual strength, is not something that believers have and some, some believers have and some believers do not have. Instead, spiritual strength is a matter of choice. It is a matter of decision. It is a matter of making the conscious decision to lay hold of the strength that God provides for us and to be strong in that strength. You know, I looked it up and I counted it, and as near as I could count, there are over 30 separate times throughout both the Old and the New Testament where the people of God are commanded or instructed to be strong. Be strong. One of the most notable places I think of comes in Joshua chapter 1. As Joshua is taking the mantle of leadership from Moses and he is beginning to step into that role of leadership and it's going to be up to him to lead the Israelite people across the Jordan and take possession of the, the promised land, God says to him, be strong and courageous. Why would God's Word spend so much time, 30 separate occasions, instructing us, telling us, commanding us to be strong if we have no choice in whether or not we could be strong? God doesn't command us to do something that is completely outside of our ability to, to do he doesn't command us to do things that we have absolutely no part in bringing about. Sure, He calls us to do things that are beyond our own strength. But He doesn't command us or call us or instruct us to do things that we have absolutely no ability to, to affect. To effectively step into and to do. So if he's calling and commanding us to be strong, that clearly tells me that we can choose to be strong or we can choose not to be strong. But here's the qualifier. Be strong in the Lord. We are instructed to be strong in the Lord. And so church, our strength comes not from ourselves, not from our own power of will, not from our own intestinal fortitude or our own ability to pull ourselves up and hold ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Rather, our strength comes from the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 through 24 says, this is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Or the strong man boast of his strength. Or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me. That I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these I delight, declares the Lord. We read in Psalm 33, 16 through 21, that no king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear him on those whose hope is in his unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our strength and our shield. In him, 
our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. And it is very much worth remembering that here in the letter to the Ephesians, one of Paul's most frequently uh, used expressions is the phrase, in Christ, or in Him. In fact, eight times in chapter 1, Paul uses one of those two phrases, in Christ, or in Him. And so it ought to be evident to us that yes, we can and we must choose to be strong. But our strength is never intended to come from within ourselves. Rather, it is supplied in our relationship with Christ, in His mighty power, which is poured into us through the Holy Spirit as we abide in Christ. Jesus Himself says in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power. Dunamos is the Greek word, and it's the same root that we get, uh, we use for the word dynamite. That kind of power. Well, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. See, we cannot be strong in the Lord unless we are abiding in relationship with the Lord, pursuing Him in the Word, pursuing Him in prayer, coming before Him in the Lord's Supper, worshiping Him, and being in Christian fellowship with other believers. And as we abide in relationship with the Lord in those things, and we are filled continuously with His Holy Spirit, the power, the dunamos that Jesus promised is delivered to us. We are given strength to stand. So we must determine and choose to be strong in the Lord, to be strong in His mighty power. And then we are instructed in verse 11 to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now I asked uh, Scott to do me a favor this week. Uh, He brought this in for me. This is his duty vest. I'm going to go ahead and put it on here. Can you all still hear me? All right. This is Scott's bulletproof vest. Uh, what's this rated for? How, how much would it stop? 40 caliber? Anything under a 40 caliber, this is guaranteed to stop. Now, as a sheriff's deputy, uh, I imagine any time you uh, put on your uniform. This is just part of the kit, right? This is every, every time you, you suit up, every time you go on shift, this is part of it, right? Uh, you, you wouldn't, you, you sir, as a sheriff's deputy, part of your responsibility is uh, not only patrolling, but you, uh, you serve warrants as well, right? Okay. And would you ever go serve a warrant without this on why not okay you value your life right this is protection this keeps you safe and and, you know while we may not be going out and serving warrants we are commanded to put on the full armor of God because we need that protection. I can tell you as, as much as uh, a, a law enforcement officer like, like Scott or uh, a, as much as they value their, their, uh, their bulletproof vests, I know in the military, the body armor, no Marine or soldier is going to willingly go into battle without his body armor on, without his, his full battle rattle. We, that's the way we would call it. The whole battle rattle. You wanted everything. You wanted your helmet and your vest and you wanted, you know, your duty belt with with all the stuff and your your, your magazines and, you know, your webbing with all the the spare magazines and you wanted your web. You wanted it all. Nobody would willingly go into a a battle situation without their, their armor and their weapons and their equipment. And so Paul likens the spiritual preparedness that we require with the armor and the weapons of 
the first century Roman soldiers that he was acquainted with and, and that they would require to go into battle. And let me say, church, that we can make no mistake about it. We are going into battle every single day that we wake up and live in this fallen world. It may not be a physical war, but it is a dangerous, deadly battle nonetheless. Ephesians 6, 12 then speaks to that battle. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now the word for struggle here, uh, one commentary that I read said this was the only place in the New Testament or in the Bible that that word, that specific word was used. But there are other writings that they are able to refer to. And this word struggle literally means to wrestle. And it speaks about a fight. It speaks, it's used to describe a battle. And so Scripture is teaching us that we are in a fight. We are at war. Now, I hadn't planned on it before this morning, but as I was going over the sermon, I felt like the Holy Spirit was kind of speaking this to me. You know, we may think about this and, and, and read this and think, well, you know, I, I don't really want to be at war. I don't, I don't want to be at war. Well, me neither. <laughs> And we might want to think, you know, I, I want to think about all the peaceful, beautiful, encouraging promises of God. And that's how I want to view my relationship with the Lord. All of the wonderful blessings and peace and joy and all of that that, that that God brings into my life. That's what I want to focus on. I don't want to think about being at war. Well, golly gee, I would like that too. <laughs> But the thing is, whether you like it or not, we're at war. And what's going to happen to a soldier who wakes up with that attitude in a combat zone? You know, this is all just a lot. You know, this is intense. I don't like this. I, I just kind of want to go through my day and focus on the positive things. And, you know, he's going to get shot. You walk around with that kind of an attitude, you're going to get taken down. Now listen, church, I'm not discouraging you from focusing on and rejoicing about all of the wonderful, beautiful, amazing blessings that we have in God through Jesus Christ. They are ours and we should rejoice in them. Amen? But we need to live every day aware of the spiritual battle that we are caught up in. Because if we don't, we're going to get chewed up and spit out. Like it or not, we are at war, and we have to take this war seriously. Because we have an enemy who is taking it seriously. And Paul wants to make sure, I, I, let me rephrase that, the Holy Spirit wants to make sure through Paul's writing that we are clear about who our enemy is and who our enemy is not. Verse 12 says that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so here we're informed who our enemy is not. In church, our struggle is not against non-believers. Our struggle is not against Hollywood or godless celebrities. Our struggle is not against those who lead sinful, broken lives. Our struggle is not against politicians. Let me say that again so that we're all 100% clear. Our struggle is not against politicians. It's not against people who are trapped in addiction. Our struggle is not against those who are deceived and confused about sexual orientation or gender identity or anything else. 
A fellow pastor said to me one time that if it's got flesh and blood, it's not your enemy. That's a beautiful sentiment. Because people are not our enemy, church. People are our mission field. Jesus Christ came and He died for those very people. He loves those people. He wants to save those people. And we need to view them the same way. We need to love them and want them to be saved and view them as our mission field, not our enemies. So our struggle is not against flesh and blood, and people are not our enemy. However, we do have an enemy. Our struggle, our fight, our battle, our war, is against the rulers, the authorities, the uh, powers the dark of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Now, Paul is addressing Satan here and his demons. Those are our true enemy. Speaking of Satan, Jesus says in John chapter 8, verse 44, that he was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. In John 10.10, Jesus says of Satan that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. In Revelation chapter 12, Satan is described as a great dragon who leads the whole world astray, it says in verse 9. And then in verse 17 of Revelation chapter 12, it says that he makes war against those who obey God's commands and hold on to the testimony of Jesus. He makes war against them. And in 1 Peter 5, 8, we're told, your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Church, God's word is very clear. Satan is not some little cartoon figure that pops up on this shoulder and an angel on this shoulder. Satan is not some make-believe idea. The devil and his demons are real beings. They really do exist and they really do contend against the church of God and the people of God. Their mission is to steal, kill, and destroy. They are seeking to take your life. They are seeking to destroy your soul. They want to steal the good things that God has for you. You have an enemy, and Satan and his demons are those enemies. And we are to take these spiritual forces of evil seriously. Satan and his forces are evil, they are destructive, and we need to be prepared to contend with and stand our ground against that enemy. But we also need to remember that the devil and his angels have already been defeated. Yes, they're real. Yes, they're powerful. Yes, they are a threat. Yes, we have to take them seriously. But do not be afraid of him. Do not be afraid of them because they are a defeated foe. Jesus Christ has already seen to that. And the command that God gives us through His Holy Spirit here in Ephesians, this command to gear up in the armor of God and to stand, is a call to victory, church. It's not some dire warning that, you know, you better get ready to take a licking. It's not that. It is a call to victory. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to take your stand or to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. This is a promise that in God's power, in God's armor, by God's strength, we will stand. This is a victory call, church. 
This is not some dire warning. This is a call to victory. Notice here that Paul does not say, if the day of evil comes, but when the day of evil comes. Again, in this fallen world, we will always face struggle. We will always struggle in one way or another in our spiritual lives. Sorry about that. I guess I'm getting too worked up. All right. Um, in John 16, 33, it says, In this world, you will have trouble. You will have tribulations. Things are going to come against you. Stuff's going to happen. But take heart. I have overcome the world. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And there are times, church, when we will feel the heat of battle more acutely than others. Times when temptation is going to hit us. Times when we have just had a day and our patience is worn to the very thinnest thread and then somebody's going to come along and start poking that last nerve. <laughs> there are going to be times when friends and people we, we thought we could depend on abandon us. There will be times when we feel discouraged and feel like giving up. And folks, Satan doesn't fight fair. He fights dirty as all get out. He attacks us in our weakness. He uses our circumstances to discourage us. He tempts us to do things that we swore we would never do. He hits us when we're down. He attacks us when we're alone and vulnerable. He doesn't fight fair. And, and Nathan, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Uh, I'm going to anyway, but I hope you don't mind. <clears throat> he, Nathan told me this morning that the night that the elders offered him the position of youth minister, that very night, his wife Leah, a deer jumped out in front of their car, and their car uh, was totaled in that. And uh, so now they're in a situation between vehicles. And then last night, as uh, he was uh, looking to, to come here this morning, he started not feeling well, and he's been feeling sick all night. And he said to me this morning, he said, it's been a while since we've been in some really strong spiritual battle, but, uh, you know, he's recognizing that that's what's happening. You know, God is moving, God is working, and so Satan's jumping in there, and he's attacking. And that's, that, that's Satan's M.O. He's not going to let us be. And, and again, he fights dirty. <clears throat> he fights dirty. He's not going to leave us alone. <clears throat> And so again, we need to be vigilant. We need to be strong in the Lord. If we are to stand, we need to be strong in the Lord. And verse 14 says, Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, this armor has six parts. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the foot gear, the shoes, the sandals, however you want to think of it, of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now we can view this armor as that which God provides to us, that which God gives us or supplies us with. We can look at it as something 
along the lines of, you know, going through the, the, the line at, at uh, you know, at boot camp and they're, they're handing out the gear, right? You know, you go to supply and they hand out the gear. We can look at it from that perspective. And to be honest, that's kind of how I always have looked at it. That this is spiritual armor we need to be prepared for the spiritual battle that we are caught up in. And so I have to go to God and seek His supply and He... Uh, issues out this armor to me and that I need to do that. I need to go to Him and have Him give me this armor. But the armor of God can also be understood as God Himself. I learned to look at this from a little different perspective this week through some, some other pastor's writings. And, and i got to tell you, I think it's a beautiful way to understand it. See, this armor ought to remind us that our strength, our power, our victory, our safety, our security, it comes from God Himself. Not just things that God gives, but relationship with God Himself. Because behind the belt of truth is the one who is the truth. And as we put on the breastplate of righteousness, we are covering ourselves with the righteousness of Christ. And as our feet are fitted with the readiness that comes from the Gospel of peace, we stand in relationship with the Prince of Peace. Behind the shield of faith is the God who is eternally faithful. In the helmet of salvation, we find the One who saves us. In the Word of God, we encounter the God of the Word. Isn't that an awesome way to see the armor of God? That we are to clothe ourselves with Him. Romans 13.14 says to clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.27 says, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. <clears throat> and as we put on the armor of God, church, we're putting on God Himself. And here's the result of that. Here is the outcome of putting on the armor of God. Putting God on. Verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, meaning after you've done what you're supposed to do, you're abiding in Christ, you've believed it, you've accepted it, you, have, you are living in it, after you've done everything, and notice in, in your Bibles, there's a comma there. This is not one complete, after you've done everything to stand. And then like it's an uncompleted thought. No, it's after you've done everything. So when you've done what your part is, you've determined to be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. You're, a, you're, you're abiding and living in relationship with the God who is the armor of God. After you've done everything, comma, to stand. This is a promise. In church, the days may seem dark. The world may seem hostile. Our enemies may seem like they surround us and maybe even outnumber us. But when we put on the full armor of God, we will stand in the power of God. Christ has already won the victory for us. The outcome is certain and assured. Romans 8.37 proclaims that in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 1 Corinthians 15.57 and 58 says, But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. 
1 John 5, 4 and 5. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world. Even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. And so wearing the armor of God, we are made strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. We are then able to take our stand against the enemy, to stand against his schemes, and to stand firm knowing that our victory has already been won. But we can't forget about our fellow soldiers. And that's what Paul addresses in verse 18. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and requests, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Our, our, our focus needs to be beyond just ourselves. Just on am I standing firm? Yeah, we need to be mindful we need to be vigilant about whether we're standing firm. We need to be decisive about standing up and being strong and putting on the armor of God. But we can't be focused only on ourselves. We have to look out for our brothers and sisters as well. We have to be praying for all of the saints. You know, I talk about it often. You guys all know I was in the Marine Corps. And... I know, represented throughout the congregation, there are a number of people from the other branches of the military. I know that you know, Mike Moon and, and Scott and Rick, you were all in the same reserve unit, right? So you were in the Army together. There's people here who are in the Air Force, in the Navy, and, and, and you know, the different branches, uh, Orlando, where's Orlando? He's, I think he's out in the, he was in the, uh, the Coast Guard. You know, and so the, the different branches of the military, we kind of give each other, you know, a bunch of stuff about who's the best branch, you know, which, who's the toughest, who's the best, who's the <clears throat> Marine Corps. And, um, <clears throat> but even though we do that, there is one principle that you see in every branch of the military. No man left behind. No, nobody, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, I don't know about the space guys, but we all live by that. No man left behind. Nobody's going to get left. No soldier's going to leave his fellow soldier. No Marine's going to leave his fellow Marine. We're going to look out for each other. We're going to have each other's back. And that's what we're being called to here. Yeah, we're called to war. We're called to battle. We're called to stand and be strong, but not just as individuals. We are to stand together. And so, churches, we wrap up here. We have to make the determination in our own heart and mind to be strong in the Lord. Be strong. Choose it. Decide it. Stand on it. Do it. Be strong in the Lord. We have to stay connected in relationship with the One who supplies His mighty strength and power. We need to outfit ourselves in Him, in His armor, which is nothing less than wrapping ourselves in God Himself. We need to lift up our brothers and sisters who stand shoulder to shoulder with us against the enemy. And so this morning as we're wrapping, wrapping up and concluding this sermon series on the letter to the Ephesians, let me ask you this. Are you in Christ this morning? Are you in Him? 
as that phrase was used over and over and over throughout this letter, in Christ. And we've learned about all that we are, all the, uh, the, the, the things that pertain to our identity and all that we have. Are you in Christ? Have you made your stand? Have you made the choice to accept Him as your Lord and Savior? That's not something that just is like automatic. We have to make a decision. We have to stand and be counted. We have to stand up and say, I am receiving Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. Have you taken your stand on what Christ has promised and what He has done? Are you standing in His strength and in His power? Because, folks, we cannot have true victory in this life or in eternity on our own strength. Christ wins the victory for us. But in Him, victory is assured. So if you've never committed your life to Christ, if you've never made the intentional decision to repent of your sin and to be washed in the waters of baptism and, and have the blood of Christ applied to you and receive the forgiveness and salvation that He offers, we invite you to come this morning. God is, is standing here today saying, come, come join me. Come join my family. Come join my army. Come be my son or my daughter. Come have victory. We're going to sing this morning, and as we do, if you have a decision to make, we invite you to come.